Well, hello there, ladies and gents. Great to see you again. Welcome back to Path to Abundant Living. Ryan Ruff, your moderator here. And as always, I'm joined by the guys in Scott Morrison and Matt Norman of Morrison Norman Wealth Management. And we're bringing you another episode here on the show today where we're, we have a, a great guest that's going to be joining us. To We're going to dive into a piece of their world, the value they're creating for their clients, and of course, that intersection between Morrison Norman Wealth Management and the expertise our guests bring to the show. And boy, do we have a great guest indeed today. We have Miss Melissa Smith joining us from Family Brand. And Melissa, she's a founder and thought leader of the family development movement. And we're going to talk about what that really means. But ultimately, she's shown parents these days how to kind of transform their family cultures and create relationships that last and, and grow together and harness values, you know, all this positivity injected into the family circle. And of course, I think is you know, it almost goes without saying, but in a in a world of just increasing challenges that we, in this complex world we live in today, boy, can the family brand and Melissa's work just kind of work wonders uh, for a lot of families out there. So we'll get into all the good stuff of what she does, how she does it with the family she works with in just a moment. But first, let's say hi to the guys. Matt and Scott, good to see you guys today. How are we doing? Ryan, great to see you. Scott, as always. Great to see both of you. Welcome, <laughs> Melissa. Welcome to Melissa. Very excited about yeah. today. Yeah, we got a good one today. Uh, before we bring Melissa on and get into her world, Matt, why don't you tee things up for us? Why Melissa? Why family brand? Why do we want to have them on the show today? Sure, Ryan. So with what we do, we know that we are having potentially generational impact on families and, and what it is that they have built and the effect that they can have, that butterfly effect for for many generations. And we said, okay, and we talk about this all the time, what we do, very, very important, but that family and the relationships is exponentially more important. And, and we know sometimes as entrepreneurs and business owners, right, you get so focused on that day-to-day -day of the business and you're purposeful and intentional. Are we taking that same energy home to our family, whether it's, you know, your significant other, your kids, you know, parents, grandparents, whatever that that family, and it's like, well, what do you what do you want to be known for? It's like, what are you doing with your business? But then on the same side, well, what what about your family, and and what's that going to look like, and the generational impact that you can have in that area as well? And we said, well, we got to have Melissa on because this is she is the expert, as you said, in this area. I love it. Well, with that being said, let's go ahead and welcome Melissa to the show. Melissa, thanks so much for for making us a part of your day and uh, carving some time away from your clients to, to hang out with us today. Yes, I love it. Thank you for the opportunity. And I do think that this conversation that we're going to have, you know, talking about our families and the impact we have on our families and then therefore our families have in the world, it is a topic that I love talking about. And I think it is so important. So thank you again. Well, thank you, Melissa, for being here. Very excited. So Basic question, just to start, what is family brand and why is it important? Yes. So we like to say that we, meaning uh, at family brand, we like to say that your family brand is your stand. Your brand is your stand. Getting clear on who you are as a family. And that includes things like your family mission, your vision, your values, um, and just also your everyday interactions. What do they look like? What are the traditions that we have? That's all part of what we like to call a family brand. Okay. So, so what was your, what was your personal inspiration behind, you know, starting family brand? Yes. It's a great story actually, <laughs> because I didn't wake up one day thinking, you know, I'm going to start talking to families about this. It was, it really was a big journey for, for me. Um, and it was my own personal journey and which looked like, um, a few different things contributed to this. Uh, one being my husband and I, we were married when we were very young and we, when we had been married about four years, we had two little boys and we found ourselves separated and we were seriously considering a uh, divorce. And we realized, you know, after looking at the options, we realized like, no, we want to create a beautiful family together. We saw these two little boys that we had together and we realized like, this isn't what we want for our family. We want to create our family together. Um, you know, that original vision that we had when we first started dating and we're married, we wanted to, to live it out. And so that kind of started us on this path of, you know, we'd kind of been living, we like to say by default, just going through the motions. And this, 
that I think was the thing that was a catalyst for setting us, um, to live a life more of like design. Like what do we want for ourselves? How are we going to get there? Um, and then it, again, that was the catalyst. And then a couple other things later on contributing to, to the development of, of this family brand, um, business now is my husband has a coaching consulting company that he helps businesses get really clear on some of these same things, which that we can get into that, um, a little bit more of that later, but that has always been such an interesting thing to me that businesses, they talk about their culture and they talk about developing their people, but sometimes we don't bring those same conversations, um, into our families. And so Chris approached me one day and he said, Hey, let's take our family through my process that we do for businesses, helping them define some of these things. And, you know, I was on board and I thought it was a good idea. And so we went through his process and out, out of it, we realized, wow, we just created a family brand. And I would say, lastly, the last thing I'll mention that uh, kind of inspired the creation of this was we wanted a narrative for our, for our kids that we felt was like a really powerful one that created an identity that we wanted for them in our family history. Um, my husband's lost two brothers to, um, suicide and, and addiction. And we realized, you know what, this, we want to, we don't want our kids to just take on some of this identity that this is what it means to, to be a Smith. This is what it looks like. We realized how can we offer them a family narrative that is we like we want it to be authentic and real but also a narrative of like what is possible for the smith family and family brand is a way that we found to do that and that we've helped other families create the same thing what does it mean to be you know insert your last name and how can we live that life that we dream for ourselves and our families so love all of it um so what so is there a I don't want to say a best type of family culture to have, or, you know, how do you build that strong family culture? You know, clearly working with you and Chris is going to help immensely, but like if someone doesn't have that, or if, you know, does that make sense? Like, okay. How do you, how do you build that? Yes. Um, So sometimes we hear from families and they say, well, we don't, we don't really have a family culture. Can you help us? Can you help us create a family culture? And I always kind of laugh and say, well, you, you do have a family culture. Everyone has a family culture. It's just a matter of has that culture been built by design or is it just kind of the default culture that exists in the home? Um, and we, it, it's been really important to me that we always, um, everything that we teach and educate around is evidence-based and research-based. And so we found that the best type of family culture to have is a culture of belonging is what we call it. And there's this book um, called Value Graphics. It talks about how the most basic human value that the human share across across the board is belonging. We all want to feel like we belong. And if we can create in our homes, the culture of belonging, where every family member feels like they belong, every family member feels like they have a voice that is going to set your family up for the most success. And, and it's easier said than done. It's, um, it is really hard sometimes in families. I don't want to get on here and say like, oh, this is all easy work. No, this work you do in your family is some of the hardest work that you will ever do because it is so confronting. We do have so much skin in the game. Um, but it is again, the most important work and that work I believe is to create that, um, culture of belonging where everyone can feel that. I'm, I'm really curious. You can, you can see that I'm, uh, you know, of a uh, mature age, uh, I have, uh, I have three of my own adult children who are all married now, seven grandchildren, uh, well, six with one on the way. Are we talking about individual, you know, like each family unit having its own culture? Are we talking about also, you know, from my perspective as a grandfather, if I wanted to build or, or at least explore our family culture, where do I start? Do I start, you know, for example, and being more intentional about identifying what that culture is? Am I talking with my kids? Am I talking with my grandkids, all of the above? How do, how do we become more intentional in that effort? Yeah, I think that, so the way we kind of explain it to families is it would be like, who are you, first and foremost, it could be, who are you sharing 
a home with. Um, but then it can go beyond that because you, you know, we've had families, couples go through our family brand process who their kids are all grown. They only have adult children and grandchildren. And for them, it almost feels like the work of a legacy. And it's like, how are we defining, like, what are the values that we want to pass on that we, we want our grandkids to know, like, this is who we are as grandpa Morrison or grandma Morrison or whatever they call you. Um, but sometimes we don't not have that clearly defined. So I think that could be a good starting place is like really sitting down and, and capturing it in words and in language. Um, and then I think any conversation though, that you're going to have, you could definitely have a, the conversation with your, with your, um, children and grandchildren about, Hey, how can we be better parents or grandparents for you? Um, and letting that conversation go where it may. And I think that would also create a feeling of, of that belonging where it's like, we want to create a place where you belong, where you feel like you have a voice. And so I think sometimes it's even asking some of those questions that might feel a little vulnerable. Um, yeah. Like, where can we do better? Where do you think that we're, we're doing okay? How can we create, um, you know, more, a better experience as, as grandparents or parents, that might be a, a fun um, good place to start. So, so you and Chris both have been kind enough to share your story. Um, and so what did, what did you guys go through? I know you, I, you know, I, you met with Gordon and so look, what did you do to rebuild? Right. I mean, you're on, you're separated and on your way down this path. Like, so obviously that's pretty far down a path. So how do you then turn things around for lack of a better term, to rebuild and be, you know, one of the strongest families that I've ever been around. Thank you. <laughs> and Gordon is a marriage counselor that Chris and I saw when we were in the, like in that kind of our lowest point. That is one thing that we did is we realized like, you know what, we have exhausted all of our resources, everything that we know how to do. So we want to bring in some outside help. And so I think that was huge for us going to see Gordon, um, who was a marriage therapist. And then when I, when I get this question though, sometimes I think like, okay, wow, there's so many things that I could point to or, or, um, say that we did. But for me, I would say it always comes back to number one, we realized that it was something that we both wanted to do. We both were in it and we were committed to creating this marriage that we wanted this family that we wanted. I think secondly, is we both took a hundred percent responsibility for, for getting there. It's, we had gotten into a good habit of, um, putting blame on the others. Like, well, if you would just do this, then I wouldn't have to do this. Well, if you would do this, then I wouldn't do that. But in us, for, in order for us to make our marriage work, we both had to take a hundred percent responsibility for, for the outcome. And I think the next thing we did is we stopped trying to fix each other. And we both started out on this path of like, okay, how can we individually become the best versions of ourselves? And so there's nothing wrong with, with you over there. There's nothing wrong with, um, nothing you need to do in order for me to love you more, but it's like, I am on my own journey and I want to get better. And as we each took responsibility for that and their marriage just naturally um improved and we just also became better and on that journey of becoming better individually it led to us becoming better collectively um and of course there were other things that we did collectively we were learning like i said we went to a marriage therapist we were learning new communication skills with each other but i would say those kind of things of taking the individual 100 responsibility and working on just becoming the best version of ourselves of ourselves were probably the foundational things that I would point to. Okay. Melissa, you know, we, we have a lot of guests on this show that are successful business owners. We're getting their slice of, of experts also, of course, you know, of their slice of expertise that is, and then Scott and Matt, obviously they work with a lot of successful business owners. And when you're a successful business owner, you have a lot of things that are happening in your life, business related challenges. You know, I'm sure there's personal related challenges, but all throughout that, your family remains constant and it's something that is one of the most cherished things anybody has in this world. So for that person out there that feels like they're just fighting an endless task list of demands and expectations and things as a business owner uh, or, a, you know, a high ranking professional of any sort, how does somebody 
take back that that cherished item, that family dynamic they have and and reprioritize it in a way so that they feel that sense of fulfillment and don't allow that, man, that uh, just that sense of drowning in tasks to keep them from being able to, to cherish what they love most. Yeah. And I think you alluded to maybe the first thing I will say is, you know, the, all the research shows when it talks about strong families, one thing that strong families do is they prior, they do prioritize their family. Um, and then, but then it's the question of like, well, how do you do that? Like, what does that, what does that look like? Um, and so the first thing that I like to tell families to do is to really look at how you're spending your time. Like look at, look at your calendar. Cause a lot of times your calendar will give you a clue as to where the time is actually going. And are you having, um, I think some of the foundational things are, are you having family meals together? That can look, that can be a really easy thing to look at. Um, are you, how much time are you spending together? Research also shows that strong families spend time together. Um, and not, we'd like to say it is not just like quality time, but it's like quantity also quality time in good quantity. Um, so that's where I would start is actually taking out my calendar and taking a real honest look about the actual time spent with my family. Because a lot of times I feel like business owners, they will say, well, I'm burning the midnight oil at work because I'm doing this for my family. But I see a lot of times the family would actually prefer them to be present more and maybe make a little bit less money or maybe be at the office a little bit a little bit less, but have their impact at home uh, or their presence at home more. How do you, I was going to say, how do you, um, I guess I'm thinking of again, now back to some small children in this whole process, Mm -hmm. how do you incorporate them into taking ownership and what, what kind of things do you give them an opportunity to take ownership for within the family in, in all of the respects that we've already discussed? Because I think so much of what we're we're talking about is again a business owner and a, you know, it could be two business owners. It could be a husband mm-hmm. and wife who both have their own businesses. How do how do you incorporate the children into that that as well, where they're taking some ownership and feeling that belongingness? Yes, I think that. So I guess one thing I didn't say earlier is my husband and I we went on to have three more children. So we have five kids currently ages seven to 17. And so I feel like I'm in the throes of, (laughs) of raising our family right now. And so I feel like I can really answer this question very authentically, like, okay, how do we include all of our kids in this process? Um, which is we try and include them as much as possible. You know, when, if we're talking about creating your family values, it's not something that my husband, Chris and I just decide on. And then we tell the kids, this is what we're doing we actively try and include them in every single conversation. Uh, We found that those that, it's a quote that basically says, those that um, help plan the battle don't battle the plan. And especially as our kids are getting older um, teenagers, we have to have their buy-in. Otherwise it just feels like this thing that mom and dad are putting on us that we don't really want any part of. But if they're part of the the process of actually sitting down and having conversations, um, who are we as a family? What do we want to be known for? I found for the most part, kids are eager to have these kind of conversations and they want to be a part of something bigger. They want to help create this family identity. Um, and we try and involve them in every step of the process. Have you ever had when discussing with your kids and how would you handle it? Sometimes siblings disagree. Or if you said, and just a simple, hey, we can have this for dinner or this, and you get the opposite answers. How do you get it so okay, well, we're going to choose this one, but not make it look like, well, we're choosing because, well, this one and this one feels like, well, I didn't want that. So I'm not part of that, not part of the plan now because you chose, you chose them over me. Yeah. There definitely is some nuance to it. And I always like to tell parents that, you know, although we're involving the whole family in the process, to really empower parents to see themselves as leaders in the process though. And so if you, you know, you get the feedback from the family maybe you, and you know, if you are married, you and your spouse go back afterwards, taking everyone's voice into account and you get to be the one that's like the leader, just like in a company, you wouldn't have, you know, once you got input from everyone on your team, you wouldn't, 
the owner or the CEO at the end of the day would have the last say in, okay, this is the direction that, that we're going to take this, that we feel is the best for, our, for our company, or in this case, our family. And so I think that that's really important for parents to remember too, is that you have this beautiful family that you are meant to lead. And so don't be afraid to lead and take a direction that maybe not everyone feels is the best. Of course, listening to them, taking uh, their opinion, op opinion um, into account, but really leading them in the way that you feel is best. So speaking of leading your family, you and Chris decided, hey, we're going to be purposeful and intentional, and we're going to sell everything and move to Hawaii with our children what <laughs> what we did do that and it was it was amazing <laughs> um that was in 2020 uh our my husband's business that i mentioned earlier went virtual he used to do a lot of in person um it went virtual and we decided you know we i was have been born and raised in arizona and had never left arizona and we kind of realized you know what this would be the time our young or our oldest rather he was 14 at the time um and we realized you know what if we are going to try something new and have an adventure this is going to be the time to do it which i will add one of our family values was at the time and currently is smiths are adventurous and we had been saying that to ourselves for years uh not necessarily being super adventurous i would say but i think that's the cool thing about family values when you develop them some of them are like maybe capture who you already are, but some of them can capture who you want to become. And Smith's Our Adventurous was definitely like one of those, something that we wanted to aspire to. And so we realized, you know what, if Smith's Our Adventurous and we do feel like we want to take an adventure, it kind of felt like a now or never because, you know, all my friends who had older kids were giving me feedback like, hey, once your kids are in high school or once they're, you know, a little bit older, you won't be able to just pick up and leave like, like you maybe can right now. And so we just, we did, we sold everything, um, our homes, our car, or just, uh, and we moved to the North shore of Oahu, which we had, we traveled there before vacation there and loved it. Um, so we decided that it was just crazy how it all happened. We had a conversation, one conversation, Chris and I in August and by December 2nd, we were living in Hawaii and we lived there a little bit over a year and just had the most incredible adventure with our family living with our five kids and two dogs on the North shore of Oahu. And we learned how to surf and we met so many incredible people and just really loved the lifestyle of us desert people living near the ocean and having that lifestyle of the ocean and the water. It's incredible. So what would you say was, is, or was the biggest impact of, of doing that? I think that a lot of it was our identity as a family, we really do believe now like that we are adventurous and that we will not just talk about things, but like we are actually doers of the things that we say we want to do. So I think that that was huge. Um, and then, you know, at a smaller level, I think every day I'm connecting with someone that we met in Hawaii, um, or my son is talking to his friends and arranging like, Hey, how can I go out and stay with your family and surf again? Um, just incredible relationships and people that continue to impact our lives to this day. That is I'm just I'm just fascinated by when you say family brand, I I I would really like to, you know, see how your kids discuss that family brand with their friends or if, if are they as, you know, clued into and as passionate about their family brand as say you and Chris are. I think there's varying degrees. Um, and it probably depends on the day too. <laughs> you know, um, one thing that I do love that we have done and that we encourage every family to do once they have established this family brand is to put it up on your wall and we call it a family brand wall. And so we have a wall, um, in our kitchen next to the kitchen table that has all of our family values and our family mission and our family vision. It's all captured there in language, in little squares, um, really cool little kind of pictures that we have up on the wall. And everyone that comes into our home can see them and they can see who we are as a Smith family and what we stand for, which I really love. And I have a friend, uh, she's become a friend. I We met online. She went through our program and she tells me this story about how 
her kids' friends come over to their house the first time after they hung up their family brand wall and started looking in there. And one of their family values is, um, their last name is Martin. Martin's bring the fun. That's one of their family values. And her son's little friend looked, looked at him and he was like, this does sound like you, you do, <laughs> you, you do bring the fun. And for her, that was just like such a testament to like, wow, I love that we've developed this language for our family and not only just for our family, but for other families too. And now other families know like who, who they are and what they stand for when they come into their house and when they're out in the world. Which is a, a great lead into what's, what are those success stories you could share with us um, now that you've, you know, taken this and turned it into a, a service for other people to take advantage of. Yes. My, so the family I just was talking about the Martins, they are probably my favorite success story. Actually, they, um, they found family brand in a time where they'll say they were kind of in, in crisis. They had a, a child who was really struggling with his mental health. Um, I think he was 15 at the time. Um, and he was actually hospitalized for suicidal ideation. And she, you know, he was getting the appropriate medical help that he needed, but she felt, you know, after they were kind of getting out of the real crisis situation, but she said, we, I knew that our family needed healing, but there was nothing available for our family collectively. You know, he had some things he was doing. I had some things I was doing, but we wanted something collective that we could be a part of. And so family brand allowed them to really just find who they were outside of, you know, maybe some of these labels they had started adopting for themselves, but realize you know, we don't, we can be defined by how we choose to be defined. And this is how we want to define our family. Um, and she, she now like helps me coach families and family brand. There's this incredible family who family brand really has transformed their, their family and their life. And then another, I mean, that's kind of like a, an extreme example, um, of the power of this work. And maybe another smaller example would be, um, another family who, as they were going through the process of developing their family values, they realized that, let me describe the process just a bit for context. We give families, we try and make it as easy as possible for families to develop family values. And one way that we do that is we give them kind of like a list of potential family values in these categories um, of strong families. So like I mentioned before, strong families prioritize their family. So we, we have, we help them develop a family value around how can we prioritize our family better? Strong families, they talk and they communicate. So how can we develop a family value around our communication in our family? Um, and so that's kind of where this family found themselves is their teenage son didn't want to participate in the process. They gave him the papers to help facilitate the conversation. And he was like, I'm not interested. Um, he finally did participate a little bit by kind of circling one thing on one page. But the thing that he selected as something that he felt was important for their family is that everyone has a voice. And so, you know, later his parents went back to him and they said, tell me more about this. This is like the only thing you circled. Why did you circle this? And he said, mom, and dad, I don't feel like I have a voice in our family. I feel like your voice and your opinion, your opinion is the only opinion that matters. And his parents, I think did such a beautiful job and really looked at that, looked at that. And it would be easy to be like, I don't agree, or that's not true, but they really looked at it, took inventory and thought like, okay, how can we create a space in our family where everyone does feel like they have a voice? And, you know, they say that it actually changed their family <laughs> by, by adding, by adding some of this language to their family, their son now went from like staying up in his room, not wanting, having, having anything to do with them. He comes down and she was, um, she gave us like this testimony, I guess you would call it. And she was saying like, my son hugs me now. And I'm like, I don't even know who you are because <laughs> before you didn't even want to talk to us or have anything to do with us. So I think that that is another example of the power of creating, uh, not just family values, but a family going back to that culture of belonging where everyone feels like they have a voice and a place and, and the power and impact of that. So Melissa, you, you talk about these success stories, which is fantastic, but I'm guessing there are times where 
one person in the family is showing up as the leader and says, I don't want to say chaos, but hey, I, I want to go down this path for our family. And then one spouse or significant other and or in this case, like kids or whatever, like they're like, you can see them arms crossed going, well, I'm not doing this. Right. Mm -hmm. So so how do you get that buy in, especially from, you know, the quote unquote leaders of the family, like where one is saying, I want to do this. And one's like, yeah, this is no, this I don't want to do that. It's very so if you're listening and you feel like I would love to do this, but my kids would never or my spouse would never, you're not alone. Like that definitely happens. So don't feel alone in that. And one thing that we found is sometimes it takes a really vulnerable, like if we're talking about a spouse or a partner, sometimes it takes a really vulnerable, vulnerable conversation saying like, Hey, I love our life. I love our family. And I think that more is possible for us. And I want to continue like creating a beautiful life with you. Um, and I think that, you know, whether it's family brand or whether it's something else, like really saying like. I want to create more for our family. Um, I think that can be a good place to start really casting the vision for what you're trying to create and how you think this thing is going to be the thing that helps you get there. Um, because I think, I just think sometimes that, you know, if someone were to throw this thing at me and say, we should do this, I would be like, no, like <laughs> why? Like, I don't, I don't want to do that. That sounds like a lot of work. Um, and I don't want to do like extra work, but to really like cast a vision for why we would, we would want to do this, what would be the benefits to doing this and what, and yeah, what are the outcomes going to be for our family and how we'll make our life better. I think that would be a good starting place to start with um, a spouse or a partner. And then for kids, I think it would be, it would be similar. I think bringing food to the conversation is always uh, a good idea. And I think sometimes getting outside of your home. Like maybe you say like, Hey, we want to, I want to talk to you guys about something important. Let's go over to the park or let's go, um, to the library or where, wherever it is. And maybe having that conversation, just like a business would have an offsite to have some of these bigger conversations or meetings, similar idea. Um, and at the end of the day, it, even if no one is interested, I don't think it's a lost cause. Like, okay, we can't, we can't do this. Um, I always love drawing parallels to business because I just think it's so fascinating that we sometimes think about our family completely different. So if you, as the leader of the business were to bring something to your company and say, Hey, I want to, uh, I would like to develop family or not family values. I would like to develop, um, company values, or I would like to discuss our, our company culture. And you got some pushback from people in your company. You wouldn't, you wouldn't just drop it. You would be like, no, like we're, we are going to have this conversation. And of course it's a little different with your family, but maybe for a time that looks like you are doing the work by yourself. Um, but it's still, I think possible. And then one other maybe piece of advice I would give is if you really don't feel like your kids are wanting to participate or do anything, sometimes you can involve them, but they don't actually realize, realize it. <laughs> it sounds sneaky, but like an example of that would be maybe you're driving in the car to practice and you, and you ask them like, Hey, what do you, what do you think our family will be known for in 20 years? Or what do you think makes our family unique? So involving them in the process of, you know, getting their feedback to some of these things, but not necessarily in this structured formal setting, which might be part of the reason why they don't want to do it. It makes perfect sense. Which I know, having talked with you and Chris and, you know, what it is with Chris's business, it's most people will fight for limitations more than they will for possibility. And so reframing it and saying, OK, if you are the one person, right, fight for the possibility that, hey, I can get the family involved with this and the results can be beyond anything that they could have ever even imagined. Correct. I mean, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but that's no. The, I think that's, that's beautiful. Yeah. No, I think that's beautiful. I think you captured it, captured it perfectly. But it, I think it is easy in families to feel deflated when no one else is on board, and to not really realize like the power of the one who believes in the, this thing and who's who's bought in, and how that really can shape and change the outcome for the whole family. So well, I think that the one of the things that makes me think of is that 
if there's that sense of belongingness or that I have value in the family, it doesn't necessarily mean that just because I throw something out there as an idea that it gets adopted, but that I was actually heard, um, mm -hmm. you know, is, is pretty powerful that, 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 that the person in, you know, within that family structure, each person is important enough to hear, understand. Um, but that ultimately, like you said, um, the parents are the leaders and are going to say, Hey, you know, great input from you, uh, something to consider, uh, but not right now. Uh, or, you know, sometimes it just comes down to that. Um, so Scott, whatever. real quick, I, I'm guessing that you may have experienced some of that at Star Commonwealth of kids <laughs> wanting to be, Scott has a, he could share with you his, just in 10 seconds, his history of working with at-risk youth, but I'm guessing you had some of that at Star, right? Where kids just, I don't want to say just want to be heard, but you could tell a difference when, when they were part well, sure. of it. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I had, I had some background in working with at-risk kids and families and, and uh, you know, trying to empower parents, but also, you know, first needing to, um, you know, have them earn the respect they needed to be able to, uh, first they needed to have, you know, the respect of their children, because oftentimes the parents weren't in a place where they were making good decisions themselves. But, um, you know, having said that, I think that, you know, tying this kind of circling back around to what Matt and I do, obviously, with our own, you know, clients and our own families is we're in the we're in the wealth management, you know, uh, space. And we're constantly talking to families about what's most important to them uh, and how that, you know, injects into their family plan, uh, their financial plan. And so, you know, I guess you know, to kind of bring this full circle, I kind of curious as to whether you've had any um, conversations with the people that you've worked with where some of the family brand leaks into the financial plan um, and what some of the goals are for families, whether it be charitable giving, whether it be, you know, where to spend their money that everybody can feel good about it, that kind of thing. Yes, we, so before recording, I, I brushed up on a couple of my, uh, facts and statistics <laughs> related <laughs> to the industry. So I'm going to share them if you don't mind. Um, and that it's basically just one statistic that it says, um, this is from Cerulli. It says of every 1000 estate transitions, 700 of them failed. And the question, you know, of course is, well, like, why did they fail? And only 3% of them failed because of, you um, know, like they weren't handled properly from a tax or legal standpoint. All that was only three percent. All the rest of the the estate transitions that failed were due to um, not articulating shared values, the um, inadequately prepared heirs, meaning they didn't establish this. And this is from their research saying they didn't establish family values, and that the heirs didn't really know like what um, the intended use of the money or the family um, values themselves were, and then. Um, Failure to establish a family mission was a was a third thing that kind of caused this estate or this um, estate transition to fail, and that is so fascinating to me because I think a lot of times in these conversations of financial planning, we don't realize like how important these topics really are. Um, and I love that you guys are bring that conversation to your clients because it is so important because the success of the family isn't you know generationally isn't just a money conversation. It is a conversation about all of these, all of these other things, like who are we as a family and who do we want to be and what do we, um, how do we want to use our money? Um, and so I have seen family brand used in a way that really helps, helps that process for financial advisors and for, for families themselves, just to get more clear as we're trying to make these decisions on, on what do we do with our estate. Um, and we also, it is an area that I want to explore more because I don't think that me and family brand has really explored how much of an impact this could have on the industry and for advisors and their families. I am, uh, right there at the top of the list. That's, as I said, at the very beginning, that it all ties together in that because, because you referenced it right from, from the research alone that shows 70% are failing. Well, those are the ones that responded, right? Yeah. How many are not responding to these surveys where it was, for lack of a better term, a train wreck, 
right? And if you talk to different attorneys or CPAs about these transitions and they can tell you, you know, countless stories of, yeah, it did not go well. And it wasn't because legally or tax wise, the structures weren't in place. It was for lack of a better term, those family issues, or there was no, they lacked, they lacked the family brand. They lacked the family brand. <laughs> exactly. So if Melissa, if someone wants to contact you and says, Hey, I want to learn more or I am ready. How do they reach you? I think the easiest way, of course, I have a website, familybrand.com. Um, we also have a podcast where we talk about a lot of these these same things, basically anything to build strong families. We talk about that on the family brand podcast, but the easiest way to get a hold of me directly would just be at uh, Melissa at familybrand.com. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for your time. Greatly appreciate it. And we know that the work you have done and will continue to do will have generational impacts that you will see some and you will most likely not see a lot of them because it's just going to go for so long for so many people and just be so positive. So thank and if you. We ever, and if we ever find ourselves in some family conversations around estate planning that aren't going very well, we can certainly refer them your way. <laughs> yeah, I would, I would love that. And I do believe that, you know, this is the most important work that, that we get, I believe that we get to do on this earth, you know, at the end of our lives, we'll look back and be like, this, this was it. Like you don't ever hear of someone at the end of their life saying, I wish I would have spent more time at work. Or, I wish I would have made more money. It's all about those relationships and the the people that are closest to you. And this is a way to really prioritize um, those things that are most important in your life. And I love talking about it. So thank you for this opportunity. All righty, folks. Well, there you have it. Melissa Smith of the family brand. Always appreciate anytime we get the chance to sit down with her. Uh, really some awesome work. Uh, you know, I've got thoughts on my own, but Matt, what, you know, what are some of your key takeaways from uh, the conversation with Melissa today? You know, Ryan, we talked about it, that that intersection between what she does and what we do. When when we're sitting down with families, right, We you're building this plan out for whether it's retirement or selling the business or college funding or whatever, whatever those goals are. But then it's like helping people start delving in further into what is that legacy that you want? And people hear legacy and they're like, oh, I got to be worth a hundred million or more to have a legacy. It's like, no, you don't, right? It's we're, we're all going to have a legacy. We're all going to be known for something as a family. And so what is it that, what are those values and what's important to you and your family that you want to pass on to your kids and grandkids and potentially great grandkids and future generations that you may never meet, but they look back and they go, Oh, that's what, Oh, Ryan. Yeah. Grandpa Ryan, great grandpa Ryan. Yeah. Now. Yeah. I, that's what, yeah, that's, that's what's been passed down generationally is what our family is known for. So, you know, again, you, you look at what it is we do really important and then you intersect it with this conversation with people and, and having authentic conversations can be, you know, difficult at times, but man, when you come out on the other side of it, you can see how impactful it can be. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. No, couldn't agree more. And and Scott, what about you? I mean, you've got the unique perspective of, of being the, the active grandfather at the moment. what did you think of the conversation? Well, I, I think, you know, where things kind of stall as, as uh, Melissa was alluding to is, you know, when, when you don't have a brand, you know, or you don't have an identity, um, you know, sometimes as a family, if if it's the, the in, in our case, it's, you know, Papa and Gigi talking about what is the future of the of the wealth transfer, um, having these conversations and, and, I, and understanding what our family brand is, is very helpful in the, the financial planning. In fact, for those for those people who don't necessarily want to share all the specifics with their kids uh, about, you know, what the wealth entails. This is a great starting point to at least identify what's most important to the family. And maybe there's ways for those parents to then, um, you know, start something, you know, planfully in that regard where the, the kids can see that, hey, we had a conversation and look at what grandpa and grandma are doing or look at what mom and dad are doing. Um, you know, they're, they're they're giving to those those causes that were, you know, that we talked about or they're important to us or to those values that we talked about um, or they seem to be, you know putting financial planning around that kind of discussion. So um, to me, that just seems like a, a great way to for buy-in um, for the family to feel like, hey, we're, 
we're we're developing an identity and we we're we're figuring out what we want to be known for. What would you take away, Ryan? Yeah, uh, well, a I love that, Scott. Agreed, and kind of piggybacking on that thought is I I think back to some of our early episodes on this podcast where we were talking about preparing heirs for their inheritance, the family constitution, some of these fundamental strategies that you guys work with families on doing, and I couldn't help but think, man, this family brand, it really feels like the 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 structural foundation, the platform, if you will, that would be built. Before, let's say the scaffolding goes up, as in those family constitutions. I mean, this is the core work that a lot of the families need to do um, that would make something like a family constitution, like those talks about values and, of course, uh, you know, the wealth transfer when the day comes so that, you know, hey, the the kids are taken care of and, and these are the expectations on what will happen financially. And then additionally, you know, we want to make sure that when that wealth transfer happens, we continue to be donors to that, that cause we care about or to continue that that legacy that we instilled kind of as a family. I just love the idea of how the family brand really is kind of the platform that initiates a lot of these conversations, which we've already discussed on the show. So it's a beautiful intersection. But the other big thing that I love is that is is the buy-in from the children. I think it's a really important factor of it all. I mean, sure, as adults, you're the decision makers and ultimately you will make the decision. But at the same time, as Melissa alluded to, the family brand is very much the adults and decision makers and the and the children. Uh, you know, you need buy-in on that that granular level from the kids as well. And it was really interesting hearing, uh, you know, some of the tactics, if you will, to to get some of the buy-in from the children because I think that's a really important part of it as well. So, just awesome conversation. I love the work she's doing. I think there's no doubt that this is an extremely valuable thing to to so many families out there. Could not agree more. Exactly. Exactly. And and I mean, look, you guys have similar conversations with folks, um, you know, more granularly speaking to the financial element at, at hand, like the estate transfer we mentioned or the call, you know, charitable giving and the causes you care about. So if anybody out there, guys, would enjoy opening up a dialogue with you two uh, to talk through some of those vehicles, you know, hoping that maybe they do already have a family brand in in a you know, in place. And now it's time to talk shop, if you will, and how we can make an impact in the world. What would be the best way they could get in touch with you guys? Best way, the traditional way, phone call 517-333-7967, or go to our website, Morrison Nordman with two ends on the end.com. And you can click on a link to schedule a quick get to know you call, or even further, if you want to schedule a possibility meeting to delve deeper into, you know, what's possible. I love it. Well, guys, I appreciate you and your time. It was fun hanging out today, of course, with Melissa. And uh, I'll see you guys back here on the next one. Sounds good, Ryan. Have a great day, All Scott. Right. See you, you very soon. All right. Till next all right, time. fellas, we'll take it easy. And hey, ladies and gents, we appreciate you all for making us a part of your day. And if you enjoyed today's discussion with Melissa Smith and you learned a thing or two, I know I certainly did, then make sure you hit that subscribe button on whichever platform you checked us out on today so that you don't miss out on future conversations like this one, where whether it's Matt or Scott and I dive into unique wealth management topics, or we bring an esteemed guest on and get into their world, this show is meant to provide value for you and yours. And we'd hate to have you miss out on any of that good stuff. Before Scott and Matt, and of course, Melissa, I'm Ryan. We're going to go ahead and say so long. But once again, thanks for stopping by and being with us on Path to Abundant Living. 